Two and a Half Admins, episode 128. I'm Joe. I'm Jim. And I'm Alan. And here we are again. And before we get started, your customary Clara plug is auditing for storage performance, Alan. Yes, an uh, article written by Jim and it talks about how you measure the performance of your system, what to look for, and more about what a storage performance audit is and why you might want to get one from Clara. Right, well, link in the show notes as usual. Let's do some news then. And the first one was a Twitter thread about taking over WhatsApp accounts with a method that is pretty old as far as I can see. The short version is people's WhatsApp accounts are getting taken over. And the way that this works leverages technically vulnerabilities in other things than WhatsApp. The deal is, if you request a password reset on WhatsApp, it sends out an email to confirm. And if you don't respond to the email, it'll try to call a phone number on file for that WhatsApp account. And if you don't pick up the phone, then it'll leave a message on the voicemail. Now, if your voicemail is secured, then there's not necessarily any real harm done there. The problem is that lots and lots and lots of people never actually change their voicemail pin. You can call in to get your voicemail from any phone number, and it's protected by usually just a simple four-digit pin. And by default, a lot of cellular carriers will set that pin by default to the same as the last four of your actual phone number. So what's happening is people are issuing these WhatsApp password requests. It's sending out, they're doing it in the middle of the night while you're asleep. So obviously you're not doing anything with that email one way or the other. Then WhatsApp calls the phone, that goes to voicemail, it leaves the voicemail. And now the attacker calls that phone number associated with that account, tries to just put in the last four of the phone number as the pin. And if they get in, then they can listen to the voicemail, they get the activation code and they can now reset your WhatsApp. To dissect everything that's wrong with that, it feels like it kind of takes a while. I I do want to note one thing first. I I was really shocked that WhatsApp is leaving that kind of information on people's voicemail at all, whether or not there is an issue with other people being able to call and get the pen, yada, yada, yada. Because even absent all those issues, it just seems crazy to me as somebody who once worked in debt collections that you would put that kind of information on somebody's voicemail. If you're not aware, if you've never worked in debt collection in the United States, if you so much as say, you owe my company $50 onto somebody's voicemail, that's a $10,000 fine each time you do it. Because legally, voicemail is considered an insecure storage mechanism that can be easily accessed or overheard by third parties. So even in the absence of thinking about whether or not phone carriers that largely predate the internet itself, because I mean, you know, most of the folks doing the cellular stuff, you know, a lot of the cellular companies predate the internet. A lot of the cellular companies are also landline companies originally that predate modern computing, let alone the internet. So it's not too surprising there's some really bad security practices going on with their customer-facing accounts. But again, just even absent all that, the idea of like, let me leave this code on your voicemail blows my mind. Yeah, it definitely should be press nine and then we'll read the code out to you so that it doesn't ever accidentally get recorded by a voicemail and that you confirm you're actually talking to a person who's expecting to get a code before you give out the code. Because yeah, basically it sounds like they send an email or SMS first, but then there's always a button to say, well, I didn't get that. And then it falls back to this other mechanism. And it's, you know, what we've been talking about with 2FA and MFA for a long time. Oftentimes it's the recovery for the 2FA that is the weakest point. Mm -hmm. It's like 2FA adds all this extra security, but we always have an escape hatch, a, a break glass way of getting into the account. And oftentimes... That's the weak point, whether that's because you just talk to someone in customer support and they give out stuff and reset stuff. Or, you know, in this case, it's an automated phone call that was perfectly happy to record to your voicemail. One of the interesting comments that I saw about this from somebody on Twitter was, uh, I'm completely secure from this hack, as are many people I know, because we just let our voicemail box get completely full and it stays (laughs) that way for the entire time we own that number. So... No sensitive data can be put on the voicemail for anybody to access. Well, the problem with that is my carrier deletes voicemails after like 90 days or something. So you can't keep it full unless you just keep getting new ones, I guess. Right. And, you know, somebody else in this way was saying just disable voicemail and someone else is maybe, but some carriers like Google Fi don't allow that. (sighs) I guess Google wants all your voicemails. (laughs) 
Google wants all your data. Yep. Voicemail is a form of data. So yes, Google wants it. Yeah. And you know, doing this in the middle of the night, because I'm guessing most people's phones are like mine, it knows when it's plugged in on the nightstand, the ringer is off unless, mm-hmm. you know, it's somebody with a star on their name or they call three times in a row kind of a thing. Perfectly good MacBooks from 2020 are being sold for scrap because of activation lock. This is a piece on Motherboard. Well, clearly they're not perfectly good, are they? (laughs) And never were. Well, yes. I've seen this covered in quite a lot of places now. The bottom line is that because of the security that MacBooks have these days and since the T2 chips were introduced, if your MacBook gets stolen, it can be remotely wiped and just disabled and then it just will never boot again unless it is specifically activated. Yeah, it makes sense for disincentivizing stealing them. It just seems like if you're selling your MacBook to a recycler that you could activate it first or whatever. Although it seems like Apple just purposely maybe didn't factor something like this in, like a way to to reset the owner at the end. But it kind of it goes back to even just our, our recent discussion of the 2FA. If you make some loophole in this to be able to pass the ownership over to someone, how do they make sure that someone doesn't do that to be able to take over the stolen MacBook? You have to compare the good versus the bad here. And I think it's a very difficult claim to make that making theft more difficult on these MacBooks is worth completely destroying the secondhand market. I can't imagine anybody being faced with both the pros and the cons there, understanding both sides and choosing will make theft slightly more difficult by completely destroying the secondhand market unless this theoretical person or entity stood to financially gain from destroying the secondhand market. And there's really only one entity that does stand to financially gain from that. And it is a substantial financial gain, and that would be Apple. Well, even if you look at going beyond the secondhand market part of it and just like the fact that these can't be recycled properly, especially with Apple kind of already having this culture of constantly buying the new one. It's like, you know, my 2016 MacBook is still perfectly fine for me. If I get a new one, I'd want that one to go somewhere and and be useful to someone rather than just becoming garbage. The environmental side of this is also a big problem. It's one and the same when it comes down to it. Uh, You know, the secondhand market is just the absolute most energy efficient and environmentally friendly form of recycling that exists, literally. And this is not Apple's first time at taking giant swipes at this. I mean, they're basically the John Deere of computing at this point. Although John Deere just settled their lawsuit and is actually going to open their shit up a bit so that people can repair their own tractors. Yeah, because they had to. <laughs> yeah. Well, they settled so they wouldn't lose the lawsuit and get forced with an even worse situation. Exactly. And and also, let's be fair, part of the reason that they're willing even to go that far is because they've been losing their grip anyway, thanks to things like, you know, hack Ukrainian firmware. But let me just push back on something you said there, Jim. It doesn't make it a bit harder to steal. It makes it totally pointless to steal one. If you steal a MacBook, it's just worthless. And there is some value in that. And I'm not trying to defend Apple here. I'm kind of playing devil's advocate. No, I agree. There is some value. I never said there wasn't. I said that it is a much, much smaller overall value proposition than what is lost by destroying the secondhand market. Do you want to push back on that? Well, no, but I think that there is a middle ground here. It doesn't have to be either or. It doesn't have to be totally open and able to just boot to anything and you know easily wipe it and sell it on. There, there should be some mechanism whereby you can contact Apple and get a key from them or, or something. You know, there, there has to be some middle ground. Or the other way around. Rather than it being by default just completely garbage to anybody but that person, maybe just have the option to remotely lock it if it's stolen. So your conditions are unlocked Mac for recycling or whatever, normal Mac that can be unlocked or locked Mac because, you know, somebody stole it. And you're like, nope, not that one. Never again. That one's a little hard, but yes, there definitely needs to be like an opt-out mechanism so that before you give it to the recycler, you can say this is unlocked or this is now in a state where it can be reprovisioned and locked to the new owner. Mm -hmm. I think a big problem with that is that a lot of companies lay people off and just quickly take the MacBooks back from them. And so they don't have time to unlock them, essentially. 
and they don't care. They've been laid off or fired or whatever. Right. Well, in that case, the laptop probably wasn't locked to that person's personal iCloud account, though, right? Right. And my, my point was basically don't turn it into e-waste unless it's been reported stolen in the first place. Don't just make everything automatically e-waste, which is what the current state of affairs kind of boils down to. Yes. Uh, it's just the, the problem I see with that is it makes it too easy to prevent it from making the, the connection that will let it do that. Yes. But again, consider the greatest good. So, But I'm, I'm even willing to go into the, the opt out instead of opt in mechanism, but something has to be done better than what's what's there right now because it is just making a giant pile of, of e waste. Yeah, and perfectly good. You know, I've got an M1 MacBook Air, which is a 2020 model, and that I would imagine has got many years of life left in it as a perfectly good computer, and it's it's just not right. And so, yeah, I guess I'm kind of on your side, really, Jim. Something has to be done here. There has to be pressure put on Apple to do something about this because it just won't do. And it, that may have to be legislation, potentially. It's almost certainly going to have to be legislation. I think everybody who's listening is probably well aware that I'm not an Apple fan, but I'm not saying this from that perspective. I'm trying to be completely objective here. When you look at Apple's model and you look at Apple's development cycle and the way that they have been running their business, their whole concept is is controlling everything. They want to be the hardware company and the software company and the everything company. They want to have control of, you know, everything from top to bottom. And they're not doing that so they can provide you a cheaper product so that they can, you know, cut the margin or whatever. They're, they're doing that so they can have everything. They're doing that to stifle competition, to own the whole freaking market. Well, they're also doing it to make the best product that they possibly can and then charge as much as they possibly can for it. That is a super convenient excuse to make. Oh, well, we're doing that so we can make the best product that we can. They said the same thing back in the 90s when they damn near went bankrupt, when they tried the same crap but didn't have quite the leverage for it and didn't have jobs on board then to have his reality distortion field. <laughs> they said that when Jobs almost tanked them even before he got fired. I remember back into the early 90s when it just very angrily looking through the pages of Computer Shopper, seeing incredibly inexpensive peripherals for IBM PC compatibles and comparing them to the prices that were three and four times higher for Apple compatible hardware. There was more than one time that I would buy an external device that was not intended for an Apple, take the damn thing apart and change the pinout on the, the hardwired cable on it to make it function with my Apple because I could get the same thing for a third or a quarter the price that way. This is not new behavior for this company. They are out there to squeeze the crap out of everything that they can. This is kind of inevitably where capitalism flows downhill. Like it's the pond at the bottom of that mountain stream that we call capitalism, right? It's always headed down there to the, the maximum money and the minimum ethics that's just what the system rewards. Am I really going to put out two shows this week where the conclusion is capitalism is the problem? I don't know. Are you? It looks like it. So here's the thing. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. My point is that for consumers, an open market is ideal. I've seen this transition in both directions in computing in my lifetime from these super tall silos where every company controls everything about their one product and none of them interoperate and they don't want them to because that means they might be leaving some money on the table or giving it to a competitor versus when you've got, you know, the open market, the bazaar, where all these things, you know, you can configure what you want the way you want. You can buy one thing from vendor A and another thing from vendor B and have them both work. And you can have a whole computer from vendor A and another one from vendor C. And they talk to each other just fine. And all that is great. That is the ideal situation for everybody in the entire society other than arguably the individual vendors. Now, in truth, it's better for the individual vendors as well in the long term because it grows the entire damn industry and economy and it's better for everybody. But then when you have a vendor who sees, they see this shining light, like I think I've got enough leverage, I can squeeze everything into the silo again and I can take 
all the money for myself. And that's where the industry has been headed for a while now. And it disturbs me. And, and to be fair, it's not just Apple. This is one reason that I'm not super big on ARM computing in general, because when I look at where ARM computing is heading, it is getting a lot more powerful. There are getting to be more things that you can do with it, but it all looks like cell phones. I mean, it might be an ARM powered laptop, but it's basically a big, ugly cell phone. You know, you, you can't, put whatever peripherals you want to in it. You can't go get a power supply from one vendor and a graphics card from another vendor and plug them into a motherboard designed, you know, to accommodate parts from wherever you want, like the wonderful old x86 days. No, it's like, here is a box. It lives in a chassis that you don't open and you use it until you're done with it and then you throw it away. And I don't want to go back to that crap. You can't just put a new NIC in to the PCIe slot because there isn't a PCIe slot. Well, so on the ARM server stuff, there is still that where you get real PCIe slots and you can put in the same video card you'd put in a regular computer in the same NICs or whatever and you do that. But that's only a, a small section of the market and only where the market demanded that we not get locked into using your special NICs where we want to use the ones we're already using, right? Whether it's, you know, the Mellanox NVIDIA ones or the Chelsea ones or whatever. And it goes to show that in the places where the customers have enough strength to be able to say, no, we want PCIe slots and be able to slot in whatever components we want, that that can happen. But when we get to this, you know, the idea of general purpose computing for people, it always seems to get dumbed down to, no, you'll just take this and, and like it. Yeah. You'll have eight gigabytes of RAM until you throw the machine away because you simply can't upgrade it. You know, that's not just in the computing industry. I know, I know, Jim, stop making car analogies with computers. <laughs> but uh, it's, but seriously, if you look at the automotive industry, it's, it's the same trends, you know. Um, mm. It used to be a lot easier to work on cars. And I'm not talking about the transition from, you know, analog to digital control mechanisms. I'm talking about the transition between, like, you can open the hood and you can see all the spark plugs and the wires and you can change them versus, oh, you want a major tune up? Well, then you need to bring it into the shop and, you know, put the whole car up on a lift and, you know, pull the, the left front wheel to be able to get it plug three to remove it. That kind of crap happens because consumers just, they don't care enough to not buy that thing. You know, they get upset after they bought it and they discover oh, this costs an arm and a leg to work on, but they don't care enough to do the research ahead of time and say, oh, well, that's bad. And I don't want to get one of those. And once the industry as a whole kind of realizes that they can get away with that, then you get enough of them doing it that now the consumers largely forget there ever was a different or better way. And they're just like, oh, this is just how it works. You know, one fairly simple solution that Apple could do here with these machines is allow them to boot from external devices but just lock down the internal storage so you can't read anyone's stuff. I don't think that makes sense. Uh, what the one of the recyclers suggested, I think, makes more sense of some kind of like a timeout. Basically, if it's been 30 days since we tried to unlock the machine and the person hasn't reported it stolen, basically, then declare it abandoned at that point. Because especially like they talked about when we get 3,000 of these dumped on us by a school board, it's like they sent them away to be destroyed or recycled or whatever. And then we bought it from the person that they contracted to do that. If we call the school board, they don't even know who we are. Uh, and they have no interest in spending any of their time authorizing us to take over these 3,000 machines. And, you know, if we didn't deal with it before they gave away the machines, then there's nothing they could do. And even if they did, it's like they don't want to go through all 3,000 machines and unlock them or whatever. And so, yeah, some kind of mechanism just there's a timeout after that amount of time. If you didn't report it stolen, then it's not stolen and, and it can be recycled. Yeah, and just make sure any encryption keys get deleted. It gets properly wiped. Right, just re roll all the keys so that none of the data can be accessed or anything, but the device gets wiped and, and is, is usable again instead of just a brick. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash 25A, support the show, and get $100 free credit. From their award-winning support, offered 24-7, 365 to every level of user, to ease of use and setup, it's clear why developers have been trusting Linode for projects both big and small since 2003. Deploy your entire application stack with Linode's one-click app marketplace, or build it all from scratch and manage everything yourself with supported centralized tools like Terraform. And check out their managed MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB databases that allow you to quickly deploy a new database and defer management tasks like configuration, managing high availability, 
disaster recovery, backups, and data replication. Simple and fast to deploy with secure access, their flexible plans include daily backups. So go to leno.com slash 25A, create a free account, and you get $100 in credit, and support the show. That's leno.com slash 25A. Let's do some free consulting then, but first just a quick thank you to everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to learn more about it, you can go to 2.5admins.com slash support. And remember, for $5 or more per month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed. And if you want to send any questions for Jim and Alan or your feedback, you can email show at 2.5admins.com. Another perk of being a patron is you get to skip the queue, which is what Mike has done. He writes, I was wondering if Jim and Alan might be interested in sharing what software they run to host their own email. I know Jim's take is that it's not worth it, and I understand that and why he recommends it, but if someone wanted to try it anyway, even for the purpose of just learning the pitfalls, what software and solutions do you guys use? Now, I swear we talked about this recently, and I looked it up, and it turns out that recently was March of 2022, so nearly a year ago. We haven't ever hit it quite from this angle before. We've we've something similar, but we haven't actually given direct advice of like, if you want to put together a mail stack, these are the components we recommend. Uh, for myself, I strongly recommend Postfix for the SMTP server. You will at minimum also need an IMAP server. I strongly recommend Dovecot for that. I would not stray away from Dovecot as far as that goes. There are other IMAP packages. I have anywhere from used to at least heavily considered all of them, and they all sucked by comparison. So that's got you for the the major components. Now, the next thing, you're probably going to want webmail. I recommend Roundcube for that. And you're going to need some spam filtering. Spam Assassin is still what I would recommend for that. This is where it starts getting tricky, though, because you're going to need some glue to tie Spam Assassin in to do your mail filtering as part of the process. And so many of the recipes out there for putting this together will have you doing the spam filtering after you've already accepted the SMTP transaction and closed the connection. And that is the wrong way to do it. Because then if you decide that that's spam and I don't want it, you end up sending bounce messages, which usually will go to a completely innocent third party who is not actually the one who sent you the freaking spam. So the right way to do this is to do your spam filtering while the SMTP connection is still open so that rather than sending a bounce message, if you decide you don't want it, you terminate the connection with an SMTP error message that says, I think this message was spam. That way, any actual person who was legitimately trying to contact you and ran afoul of your spam filter will know that their message wasn't delivered because their own mail server will tell them their mail server wouldn't take this from me, boss. I'm sorry. Meanwhile, you run no risk of actual, actually, you know, backscattering out to innocent people. And not only does that piss off innocent people, it will screw you over. Because if you emit backscatter, you're going to end up on all the email blacklists yourself, and you will no longer be able to deliver your legitimate mail because you're flagged as a spammer. I should have said block list there instead of blacklist. I'm still getting my terminology correct with the change, for the record. Anyway, um, in order to put the glue together, to get these things to go together, there is a great package that I don't see anywhere near enough people using called Postprox. Postprox will allow you to insert your own scripting inside this workflow so that you can say while the connection is open, after we've gotten the message, before we send the SMTP 200 to say that we accepted it, I can perform these arbitrary actions on it. When you do that... The other important thing is if you're going to have any volume whatsoever, you don't want to run the command spam assassin, which fires up a Perl script. What you want to be doing is you want to be running spam D, which is the daemon version of spam assassin. And the command that you're calling from your script is spam C, the client that talks to spam D. If you don't do that, you're not going to be able to manage any kind of volume and you're going to have timeout issues because sometimes it will take you too long to process your filtering requests. All right. So the next thing is you may think, okay, well, I also need, um, I've got my spam filtering. I need antivirus filtering as well. Now, my first answer to that, to that is going to be, no, you don't. Because Spam Assassin is actually going to do a better job of catching the malware garbage in there than any antivirus client I've ever seen that I can plug into a, a mail flow process. And the other thing is I very, very, very strongly recommend do not use Clam AV. 
those developers just aren't trustworthy. And I don't mean that in a they're going to like they're out to get you and put malware on your computer sense. But they make decisions like we don't think people have updated the software frequently enough for our tastes. And we know there's a bug in it. So we're going to craft a malicious library update that will cause your, your clam AV to crash. And eventually you'll notice that it crashed and then you'll update it. They just don't put that into your mail flow, please don't. Yeah, uh, basically exactly the same stack, adding in like open DKIM to do the domain keys signing and so on. And that's about it. Definitely check the spam inbound, not afterwards, so that, yeah, you can still give the negative, I'm not accepting this email, so people will get an error message, but not as backscatter. That's definitely really important. And yeah, spam D rather than running spam assassin inline, because the amount of time it takes for a Perl script to spin up and process all of its config and grab all the stuff versus, well, I already have that in lo memory loaded, running and running, and I'm doing just deal with it, because... I've run mail servers that had decent amounts of traffic, and it really does make a difference to have that process already hot in RAM versus starting it up separately for each email. It really gets back to, you know, the whole idea of like fast CGI for doing this for web apps. And yeah, the rest of it is domain keys and, and DKIM. And what's the other one I'm thinking of? The way where you get notifications about your messages that were marked as spam. Are you talking about DMARC? DMARC, that's the one. Yes, so we use Open DMARC and Open DKIM and slot those in with uh, Postfix. I hate that they named that DMARC because to me, DMARC yes. is the point of demarcation where you travel from one service to another service and the liability changes from one party to the other party. Yes, it's kind of related to that in that it's a way for the people on the other side to send you a message, but that isn't backscatter. And it's more like you process them programmatically instead. But we've not found it that useful, but it helps with delivery. So we set it up anyway which is uh, how too much of email works. And then the other thing we've done is for work, we're actually using like Office 365 or whatever, but we set up the Exchange Connector thing so that for our internal services that need to be able to deliver stuff, our Postfix can send it to Exchange, which can then deliver it to make sure that the stuff from our, like our ticket system actually gets to people's inboxes and doesn't get marked as spam. As you're describing that stack, just yakety sax is playing in my head. Yeah, but basically <laughs> all, all it's doing is, is Postfix does everything, but the last step is route it via Microsoft so that other people will accept it, which is a sad state of affairs. But having the DKIM and the SPF and all that didn't mean our messages actually got to people's inboxes, but bouncing it through an exchange server at Microsoft meant that it was on the very, very short list of people whose messages don't go into the void. Well, back before I gave up and just started using managed email, I used Exim, but the guy who taught me to do that also voted for Brexit. So, you know. <laughs> Xim was pretty good for a while, but it's not been for a long time. When I had to set up a new one, I looked at it and I'm like, Postfix is much easier to set up and makes a lot more sense and doesn't have really scary vulnerabilities frequently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan of the vulnerabilities, but I was a fan of how easy the config files were to deal with and how to add aliases and new accounts and stuff. Well, it wasn't so easy to deal with when you had issues that involved like needing to go in and do surgery on the queue. I can tell you that. Yes, post six queue management stuff is much nicer. Uh, as far as the account management stuff, I just have some profiles that put it into MySQL and I can manage it nicely. With Exim, I was using it partly as part of a, a control panel software like cPanel that was called Direct Admin. And it had these really like multi-line config statements that would do stuff like look up the domain in this file and that'll tell you where the password file for each different domain is and then look it up in there and there's a separate aliases file and password file for every different domain and there's going to do all this stuff and like running a bunch of commands to then decide whether we accept the message or not kind of a bit like what jim was describing for doing the spam assassin on the inbound side but really complicated config instead of a nice scripting language or actually i think with xm we had it set up so that the thing actually listening on port 25 or whatever was a spam assassin thing that then would only pass it into Exim if it passed the spam filter. And then it would go through spam assassin a second time to do the subject tagging for the stuff where it's like maybe spam and we want to flag it, but still deliver it to the inbox or whatever. It was gnarly. Right. Well, we'd better get out of here then. Remember, show at 2.5admins.com is the email address if you want to send in your questions for Jim and Alan. You can find me at jrs.com slash mastodon. You can find me on Twitter at jrssnet. 
And I'm at Alan Jude. We'll see you next week.